Welcome back, everybody. Sorry, there's an echo there. And we're now ready for the Ask the Specialist. So we are going to get through as many questions as we can. Just checking we have everyone with us. I'm starting to see everyone appear. Dr. Hakeem, Dr. Frank Amano, Professor Malfay, Shane, Shaney Weber, uh, Dr. Simmons. And do we have Professor Aziz? Okay, I will start with who I can see. Okay, fantastic. So a question for um, Dr. Frank Amano. Um, what do you think about aging with hypermobile EDS? Does it get progressively worse? So this is a very, very interesting question because I think it's variable what happens to people with aging. Some people find that um, as they get older, the joints become a little stiffer as is naturally the case with aging. And some of the um, complications related to the hypermobility may be less. Um, I've had other patients who've had experiences where their, their uh, symptoms become more pronounced with aging. So it's a, it's a variable thing. And I think it's important for us to understand what are the factors that help people do better uh, with aging and to try to encourage them to um, do those things that will improve their quality of life with age. Thank you. Now we're going to go to Dr. Simmons. Is using a chiropractor advised against for EDS patients? I say advising against. Um, can you hear me? Can you it's hear me? a little bit muffled. Um, That's better. Is any better? I'll put my other plug in. Hope you can hear me a bit better now. Yeah. Okay. So this is very interesting. Um, and it's a very good question. I wouldn't advise against a chiropractor. I think there are many excellent chiropractors. I think it's important to understand what the chiropractor is uh, offering. So if you think that chiropractic or if the chiropractor is offering manipulation, a passive form of intervention and offering uh, an adjustment uh, if you like, to joints, then that can be controversial here. Because the most important thing with hypermobility is the control of movement. This is a movement condition. So what people need is an intervention that helps people to move better. So it's not about having a, um, a grade five manipulation because that can be very, can be, I think, a, a problem for people. But if someone can offer something that's going to improve movement function, that's what we need. So that's where I suppose physical therapy and exercise interventions are the most important thing. So I think it's about understanding what the chiropractor might be offering. Is that okay? Thank you very much. Okay, now we have a question for Shaney. How does one go about finding primary care doctors in their area who are EDS and HSD friendly? That's such a great question that we get frequently. Um, in order to find doctors who are long distance or at least willing to learn, it is good to um, connect with others in your area. You can do that by contacting your support group. We also have a medical professionals directory on our website. Um, so head there and see if we, there are uh, clinicians that are listed in your Thank you. Okay, and I think we may have Professor Aziz with us. Uh, Professor Aziz, can you hear me? Okay, um, tech team, if you could work on that for me, please. We are going to go back to a question for Dr. Frank Amano. Can, uh, this came up yesterday, but uh, sorry, on Friday on the rarer types day, but we've had quite a lot of questions on this. Can two members of the same family have different types of EDS? So 
theoretically, it's possible. Um, uh, you could have two partners who have different types of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome who might have met at a learning conference along the way and um, had, had children together. And then it would be possible that their children could inherit one or the other type from one or the other parent. Um, in general, though, I think it's much more likely that there would be a single type of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome within the family. And if there are different manifestations, say in a parent and a child, it probably represents difference in the, what we call, variable expressivity of the genetic disorder. Thank you. And Dr. Hakeem, are there specific labs that we should be looking at, like thyroid levels or common deficiencies, maybe D or B12 in EDS and HSD? Yeah. Um, so I'd say that there is no sort of specific blood test that one would do for um, EDS or HSD, other than for EDS, um, you know, the comments we've already had about uh, doing genetic markers uh, or um, uh, particular um, urine tests to um, reach a rare disease diagnosis. But um, when um, I see somebody in clinic, there are often reasons why I need to do uh, or consider doing quite a lot of different blood tests for a lot of the symptoms. So let's take fatigue as maybe one of the most common symptoms alongside pain that somebody would be uh, presenting with. I think it's really important that um, blood tests are done to make sure that we ruled out causes of fatigue that can be corrected. So in my list of labs or blood tests that I will do, uh, a red blood count, part of a full blood count, uh, kidney function, liver function, uh, thyroid function, uh, something called the CK, which is a muscle enzyme to make sure that the muscles are not overworking, uh, and a morning cortisol level. So these would be in the context of fatigue, for example, because if you find abnormalities there, you might then go looking for causes and treat the causes uh, and, uh, and therefore manage an underlying cause for fatigue. But a lot of people also have, as we've heard in um, presentations uh, this, um, uh, this afternoon, things like um, uh, either poor intake or poor absorption. Uh, and so it's useful to have a look at the uh, metabolites. So iron, folate, B12, vitamin D, calcium, and magnesium. And these levels, if they're quite low, can interact in, uh, with things that I've just talked about and cause fatigue too. We also look for any evidence of systemic inflammation as a cause for fatigue. And so we'll measure something called the ESR or the plasma viscosity and the CRP. So these are all things that we might choose to, to, to run. I'm not saying they should be run, but they may, they may be pertinent. There are some other specific things um, that, that should be considered. If you're somebody who has severe bleeding uh, or severe bruising um, and, and it suggests there's a clotting problem, then clotting blood tests should be done. Factor five Leiden should be considered and also something called platelet aggregation tests. Um, Anne Maitland uh, has spoken about the um, tryptase levels and the urine markers if there is mast cell activation. And then I think finally, there's this whole question of whether somebody may also have some form of autoimmune disorder. Um, and uh, there would be a number of different autoimmune blood tests that we might recommend um, if we were looking specifically for joint disease, or a neurological disorder, or maybe a gut disorder, or even an endocrine disorder. So, you know, there are lots of reasons why we might do labs uh, as part of a workup in somebody with EDS or HSD. Great, thank you. And I can now see Professor Aziz, welcome. Uh, just gonna have a question for Dr. Simmons. Um, we've got a lot of people saying in different ways, why is it that when I go for physiotherapy, I, I seem to feel worse? Um, or I, I, is it something that's wrong with the therapist or is, or is this something people need to get over and, and it will improve with time? But a lot of people seeing this, that this pattern of things getting worse, what can you advise? I think that's a really good question, um, Lara. And I think one of the reasons why I've spent so much time trying and working with 
other therapists to try and improve our interventions. The thing is that um, it, it's a bit like with the interventions for medications. I think oft times physiotherapists go in a bit hard line wanting to give exercises that are perhaps slightly beyond where somebody is at a time. And we've now shown with some of our, our research now at Imperial College that people with hypermobile EDS or even uh, hypermobility spectrum disorders are often very, very weak. And we need to start at a much, much lower level, just like we might do with the medications because people are very sensitized. So I think it's about people coming together, the therapist and the patient, to start at the right point. Because exercise sometimes, if you've got inflammatory things going on, can actually activate an inflammation. If people are very, very weak, they will respond and their, and their, their systems are very sensitized, they will um, have an exaggerated response. So we need to start at a very low level often. And this is what I think it's very important for us to be communicating for patients when they go to the therapist to say, it's something like, I'm very sensitive. I need to start at a low level. And for therapists to recognize that this group of patients are also very sensitive. And we just start, you know, I have patients that start with 30 seconds of exercise. And I think it's at that level we start to move on. So it's finding the baseline. I hope that answers that question. Yeah, no, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, Professor Aziz, uh, when gastroparesis is non-responsive to medication and lifestyle changes, what would you do as the next step? I think one needs to uh, just review everything in the history very, very um, carefully. Um, I see patients with gastroparesis who are not responding to treatment because there are other reasons why they have nausea, for instance, and fullness. Uh, nausea is a very common symptom which occurs even uh, very frequently in patients with POTS as well. So just treatment of POTS, for instance, uh, will sometimes improve, improve the nausea. Similarly, severe constipation can often have a back off effect on the stomach as well. Um, and therefore treating the constipation uh, may help. But if you've tried all of that and nothing, if it is a really a situation where medical treatment has, um, has failed in every respect, then the next step is usually to try um, Botox injection to the uh, pylorus. Now, the, if you look at the data on this, um, well, initially there was quite a lot of enthusiasm for use of Botox uh, into the lower end of the stomach where it opens into the small bowel. Uh, however, uh, there was a, a large multicenter study which did not show efficacy, but we do see individual patients who respond. Uh, beyond that, if um, things are still not improving, we may have to consider uh, gastric electrical stimulation, also described as gastric pacemaker. But my experience, unfortunately, in EDS patients is not great with the use of um, gastric pacemaker. It's an option. One needs to think about it carefully, but one also has to be realistic that uh, it's not as effective as it is in some certain other conditions, such as diabetic um, gastro gastroparesis. Um, and, and the next... Um, spectrum uh, in terms of um, you know if nutrition is really being impaired weight loss is occurring then one has to consider um, uh, you know enteral nutrition artificial nutrition uh, in the form of um, either uh, direct feeding into the stomach uh, or the small bowel uh, are options that sometimes sometimes need to be considered but um, those are more severe cases and most extreme end of the spectrum Thank you. That's great. And a question for Shaney. How time consuming is the ECHO advocacy program? Would it be possible to complete it during a semester or of school or college? And can you let us know when the next cohorts will be running because it's currently showing full up on our website?
let me unmute myself. Uh, thank you so much for that. The uh, Advocacy ECHO program uh, occurs once per week uh, for seven weeks. Uh, those usually are consecutive weeks in, in um, a virtual conference happening, in which case um, there may be a skipped week. Uh, each session is 90 minutes long. We are offering a sessions uh, later in 2020 as well as in 2021 and beyond. We have been blown away by just how many people raising awareness and doing advocacy work to increase uh, the care that those that have these conditions um, receive. And so we have a wait list. We are going to keep doing Advocacy ECHO until every person that wants to take this program is able to. So thank you for that question, and I hope that you can join us. Thanks, Shaney. We're having a little bit of issues with your Wi-Fi connection, so uh, apologies for that. Um, question now for Dr. Hakeem. Can you please address the need for sleep and how much is really needed? Right, okay. Um, so I, I think you know, a lot of people ask how much, but I think I would probably start with not quantity, but quality. Because I get a lot of people say to me, for example, well, I had 10 hours sleep and I still feel awful. And the thing is, I don't think it matters if you have five hours sleep or 10 hours sleep or 15 hours sleep. If it's not good quality sleep, then you're not going to get the refreshment that you need. So there are you know, natural averages um, of uh, six to eight hours that most people would need. But when people tell me they have trouble with their sleep, I think there are lots of things to explore. The first thing is uh, the pattern of when they are trying to sleep throughout the day, uh, throughout the 24 hours. Um, the second thing is sleep hygiene. Um, uh, we are thinking about things like, uh, is the room the right temperature? Uh, is it quiet? Uh, have you just spent the last two hours working with, on your phone or with electrical equipment uh, rather than maybe you know, reading something uh, light from a book or listening to some music or radio? Um, so you know, is there too much stimulus? Those sorts of things in terms of, sort of sleep hygiene. Even, unfortunately, partners in the room with you who might snore and keep you awake. You know, all those sorts of things that, that are um, really important to explore about what might be disturbing sleep. Then I think it's important to um, think about some of the medical issues that might be disturbing somebody. So pain is an obvious one. If you go to, if you go to bed in pain and you are woken up throughout the night in pain, uh, then obviously you're getting a very, very disturbed sleep. So trying to identify both medicinal and non-medicinal um, sort of tricks, techniques for uh, trying to control pain. Some people even find that they dislocate uh, in bed at night. So are there ways that we can actually uh, uh, stop these things from disturbing you and waking you? Very interestingly, and um, Dr. Alan Persinki has this uh, in one of his wonderful talks, which is uh, one of our webinars on the website. Uh, there's this issue of people just um, gradually going along the night in a very, very shallow sleep, being almost woken up uh, with a very, very fast heart rate. So there are lots of medical things that we need to think about. And of course, sleep apnea is another one uh, um, uh, to think about, which was discussed with Dr. Bascom uh, yesterday. So you know, um, quality of sleep is fundamentally important and there are lots of things that can interfere with it and those are the things that should be explored. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Frank Amano, what are your thoughts on medicinal marijuana use as a step for pain management in EDS and HSD? That's a really great question. I think there are a lot of people uh, who are finding that medical marijuana has been a really helpful adjunct to their pain management regimen. Um, unfortunately, accessibility to medical marijuana really varies depending on where people are geographically. 
So it's not available as an option to many people um, in the US. There are some states where medical marijuana is not yet available. Um, however, CBD, which is one of the active ingredients in medical marijuana, is also um, manufactured from hemp. And uh, in the US, at least, um, hemp-derived CBD is available uh, over the internet and you can buy it uh, over the counter. And many people find that CBD can be helpful not only for pain management, but also for GI symptoms, for anxiety, and for help with sleep. So I think medical marijuana and CBD both can really have an important role in managing symptoms for people with EDS and HSD. Perfect, thank you. And uh, Dr. Simmons, do patients with EDS and HSD need more time to recover after exercising? Great question, really great question. So our emerging research has shown us that people with uh, symptomatic hypermobility are uh, between 12 and 16 weeks weaker than those without hyper HSD or HEDS. So I think you need to, we need to think about that. People, we've, we've shown that actually people with these conditions strengthen at the same rate, but they often start from a lower baseline. So I think what we need to see here is that actually it potentially takes between three to four months longer because they start from a different baseline. And so this is the message to any of the therapists in, the, in this audience and also to the patients, actually starting from a different starting point. Um, and so we start at a very low level, uh, that we start very gradually because people are more vulnerable when they're, more, when they're weaker. But we take them through this process and yes, it does take longer as far as our research suggests so far. Thank you. Um, Professor Aziz, um, how is leaky gut diagnosed and treated? <laughs> very good question. Um, there aren't really very good uh, clinical methods of diagnosing them routinely and most clinical laboratories and hospitals actually do not have the diagnostic tests um, available to them. There are Quite a few um, research uh, oriented tests that are available and the most common one that is used is called the double sugar test so you take two sugars and then you see how much uh, sugar is absorbed and then passes into your urine um, and uh, therefore you measure urine over a long period of time to see how much of the sugar has, um, has come through and that gives you an idea of uh, the absorption of the sugar. Um, so um, but, and, and there are a couple of other uh, very research oriented um, um, blood tests as well, um, such as Zonulin and so on, um, which can be considered. Um, but none of them are really um, in standard, usual hospital laboratories are routinely available because they are considered experimental and uh, very research based. Um, another uh, method of looking at the leakiness of the gut is to take a biopsy. Um, and examine that for the uh, tight junctions. These are junctions, proteins that hold cells together. And in leaky gut, these tight junctions are damaged and there are more spaces between cells. But again, very research uh, oriented, but if at all, uh, there are some labs uh, in the nutrition medicine field that offer the double sugar test. Um, so that's probably the test that is most easily um, available. And, in, in, with respect to um, treatment, that uh, again, there isn't any specified treatment. There are some um, small uh, animal studies which have suggested that glutamine uh, may be helpful, but there are really no major clinical trials. There are similarly, there are small um, clinical trials that have been done in athletes um, uh, about, uh, who old, can also develop uh, leaky gut, uh, especially after a long run. Uh, and colostrum has been experimented. There's some human studies on colostrum, effective colostrum, and there's some studies on in inflammatory bowel disease as well. But these are very small early phase studies 
and large scale studies haven't been done to give us confidence to say that this really works. But in those early phase studies, there has been efficacy um, that has been demonstrated. Similarly, zinc carnitine is another um, uh, sort of um, uh, you know, uh, uh, medicine which can, which is available through health food shops. Uh, and there are small uh, clinical trials in, in, in humans which show that it may have efficacy in inflammatory bowel disease and so on. But again, we are very early phase and we're not at the stage where they can be routinely um, recommended for, for use. So the main gist of what I'm trying to say is that there is some progress there. There is progress in trying to understand leaky gut. Uh, we are currently, for instance, doing a study of vagal nerve stimulation to see whether that has an influence. Uh, in leaky gut. So there is work going on that there isn't really any clear treatment that has emerged. But one of the most important aspects is to try and find out what is the trigger for a leaky gut uh, and manage that. For instance, celiac disease patients get a leaky gut. In patients who have some form of inflammation in the gut, that can lead to leaky gut. And while it's not been proven, but certainly people with lots of allergies, even patients, uh, children with asthma, eczema, et cetera, have been shown to have not just leaky skin, but leaky gut um, as well. So trying to manage a potential cause of the leaky gut is also um, uh, important. But um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this field. Thank you very much. And now a question to Dr. Hakeem. Do tissues weaken over time with EDS and HSD, causing increased issues such as hernias and prolapse, or does increased wear on already weak connective tissues cause the increase in issues? <laughs> right, uh, pro probably both of the above, I imagine. Um, I mean, I, uh, so yesterday I spoke uh, in my talk about this concept of time um, and how things appear over time. So clearly there are different um, uh, environmental pressures on tissues at different times in our lives. And I think our tissues also just naturally get weaker as we get older. Our muscular uh, ability gets weaker as we get older, etc., etc. So um, let's take, for example, um, uh, something like weakness in the pelvic floor. There may be a vulnerability there from a very early age, uh, which is related to the connective tissue problem. Um, but it needn't manifest itself necessarily until maybe later on, perhaps during pregnancy or later on in life when we already know that there is an increased risk of prolapse and other problems such as urinary incontinence. So we have both the natural aging process that happens to everybody and probably an increased risk uh, in the existing um, tissue fragility in somebody with EDS. The two are going to be combined. Thank you. And a question for Dr. Francomano. Is um, Tenex and B gene testing available? And what is, obviously, you may know in the US, but the approximate costing um, for someone to be able to do that privately? Oh, sorry, uh, Dr. Francomano, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry. The uh, tenacinex gene testing is a, is a particularly challenging gene test because um, there are several uh, copies of that gene in the genome and only one of them is actually an active form of it. So we have several what we call pseudogenes related to tenacinex and it makes the um, commercialization of that particular test very challenging. So I am not aware right now of a commercially available Tenacinex test in the United States. I may be mistaken. If anybody knows of one that I don't know of, please let me know. Um, it's being done on a research basis in a number of labs, but I, I don't think we can do it commercially right now. Thank you. And question for Dr. Simmons. Um, lots of questions surrounding massage. Um, when, what is the right type of massage? And is it helpful when physical therapy isn't enough or can it be harmful? Well, I would say that massage is part of physical therapy. 
So I think it's all part of the physical therapies. And massage can be incredibly helpful. Um, and who's providing that? I think people can draw on a wide range of people who can provide it. The reason why it's helpful is because for many people who are hypermobile, they will have spasms in muscles. Uh, the spasms are there potentially because of pain, or there'll be spasms there to protect joints. And what happens is you get centers of sensitivity, trigger points. So massage um, can be very helpful for relieving this muscle tension that is often there, that, which is often developed to protect the unstable joints. What's important if you are having massage, you also need to be doing the exercise to improve the strength and stability around joints. So yes, it can be helpful, but always get it alongside someone who's also able to provide some kind of exercise intervention, which can help to uh, get this kind of balance between muscle tension and strength. I hope that makes sense. Is that thank that thank you. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, now a question for Professor Aziz. Is gastrointestinal bleeding found more often in the EDS and HSD population? Not really, no. Um, there's no indication that gastrointestinal bleeding is more common in heads patients or HSD um, patients compared to um, uh, you know, other groups of patients. Um, we've actually just completed a um, study uh, 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 jointly with uh, colleagues in Maastricht looking at whether patients with heads and HSD complain of more pain, complications, perforation rates, etc. during colonoscopies and we found no difference whatsoever. So I, I don't think that this is a, uh, a problem for uh, heads and HSD patients. But of course, vascular uh, patients, etc. there would be an increased risk. Thank you. And question to Dr. Hakeem, is there a benefit to having an HEDS or HSD diagnosis and are both conditions treated different medically? So this I think is picking up on the, um, the conversation that we're all having at the moment around the concept of a spectrum um, and a particular sort of cutoff point as a consequence of the criteria uh, for hypermobile EDS uh, versus HSD. Um, and um, uh, we are all, I think, uh, commonly of the same view uh, that we recognize that the uh, plethora of comorbidities or related conditions can occur in both groups. And so it, it does beg the question, what is the difference? When it comes to treatment, uh, we also, I think, are very much all, all uh, pretty much in the same, the same mind that we use the same kinds of adapted treatments for both groups. That said, uh, many of the things that we, uh, that we use in our treatment armory, for example, uh, pain medicines or treatment for um, uh, POTS or orthostatic intolerance, for example, um, are actually borrowed from our knowledge of how they work in other conditions. They're not based on any studies uh, in any patients across the whole spectrum from HSD to HEDS to rarer types of, uh, of EDS. So when we talk about treatments in this way, um, even adapted treatments, we are using the same armory for all of these conditions. So why have them separated? Well, one of the perhaps key arguments for continuing to uh, work with patients in, in sort of two different categories is that if we do identify over time that there are particular mechanisms that might be causing um, the pathologies that we see in these conditions, they may be different between different patient groups. And that difference might actually drive us 
to identify new novel treatments that we don't have in our armory at the moment, or indeed to identify kind of new genetic markers that we don't know about at the moment that might tell us more about the pathology that's driving the condition. That doesn't stop us from doing studies that study patients with HSD and their response to treatment and patients with hypermobile EDS and their response to treatment and demonstrating that they're both the same and therefore bringing them together and saying they should all be treated in this way. Or doing the same study and demonstrating that actually there are differences, in which case why and how does that make us, uh, how, how, does that, how does that change the way in which we consider treatment in particular groups. So my guidance at the moment is not to be overwhelmed by the difference or the similarity, but to accept it's there and allow us to continue to look and understand if there are differences or not that might actually lead to some important variation in the way in which we treat people. Great, thank you. Uh, now a question for Dr. Francomano. Do older retired EDSers need a genetic doctor and what type of team do they need? Many were diagnosed late, don't have teams and are concerned about the future elderly years when it's difficult to self-advocate. Such a great question. Before I get to that, can I just make an addition to the previous question that I answered? Um, the Tenacinex question, I did a quick look, and there actually are three laboratories uh, in the U.S., Ambry Genetics and uh, GeneDx and Prevention Genetics that are now offering um, Tenacinex testing. So that's, uh, I would say, probably new within the last year. Um, and if people are interested in the Tenacinex testing, they should seek uh, help from a genetic doctor who can help order those tests. Now, in terms of building a team for older people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or hypermobility spectrum disorders, I would say that really the principles are exactly the same as they are for younger people because the um, range of comorbid conditions that exist in the older population is very similar to what we see in the younger folks. So, um, it's very important to have a primary care doctor who's really willing to be an anchor and uh, to implement any recommendations from consultants. And then depending on the various comorbid conditions that a person is living with, uh, to have specialists who can help in guiding the management of those various, uh, special, those various issues. Um, I know Dr. Peter Byers likes to say all management is local, so it's very, very important to have people uh, close to home and uh, put in a plug for our ECHO program here if they can get their primary care doctor to participate in an ECHO program and have some expertise as a result of that in the management of the various comorbid conditions, it would be very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Simmons, um, how do people know if they are overstretching? What is the best way to measure a stretch in EDS and HSD? Okay, so stretching is a, a huge topic for discussion here. Um, stretching is important um, because many of the muscles go into a kind of contraction. But it's very important that we undertake controlled stretching. So this means, so excuse me. So this means that um, whatever stretching is undertaken, it's actually very, very well con contained. So when people stretch beyond, there are often stretching joints that are going. Yeah, I suppose some joints are going very, very, very deep into their range and others aren't being stretched. So the stretching does need to be controlled. So I would suggest that you undertake your stretching initially with someone who can um, assess that. So when, I, when you stretch your hamstring muscles, for example, it's very easy to overstretch your lumbar spine. 
so you need to be very careful about what you are stretching. So I would say get feedback if you're going to Pilates, that would be very helpful. Pilates instructors can really help here. Your physical therapist can help here as well. But it's not about just ex just stretching everything. It's about about a very controlled stretch, which can be very helpful for relieving tension and pain. But it's not a good idea to stretch everything. So it's very 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 specific. Sorry, I've got hiccups. <laughs> no problem. And uh, Professor Aziz. Could you describe the difference between slow gastric emptying and gastroparesis? Gastroparesis is, is basically a much more severe form of um, stomach, delayed stomach emptying. So you can have different grades of stomach emptying, mild to moderate to severe, and it's more the severe end of the spectrum, which um, I think is the better way of describing gastroparesis because paresis means paralysis whereas in the vast majority of patients we don't see a stomach that is effectively paralyzed it is slow and emptying um, that in my opinion is an accurate uh, way of describing it you could also say that gastroparesis can be mild moderate or severe uh, in its uh, uh, you know presentation uh, and some, some people tend to use that uh, particular term so these are terms that are change uh, used interchangeably um, so you can have you can say that all of this is gastroparesis but it can be mild moderate or severe or um, the other alternative way which i prefer is because i feel that paresis is an extreme term paresis means paralysis uh, and i uh, and i like to classify that as mild moderate severely delayed gastric uh, gastric emptying paresis we tend to see when there is no effectively very little gastric emptying occurring um, over a very prolonged um, prolonged period which uh, happens uh, we see patients with uh, hypermobile EDS and other forms of EDS um, have that but that's not such a common uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Dr. Hakeem, is it possible to, for someone to have hypermobile EDS without a positive family history? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, no, I mean, the family history um, is one aspect that we will explore as part of the diagnosis. Um, but I see uh, a lot of people who present as the first member of their family. What I would say, though, is that I think a lot of members of families don't know uh, that they actually have the signs and symptoms or their diagnosis has been missed. So I, I sometimes get a history and I can see some of my colleagues smiling and nodding uh, where somebody comes along and says, no one else in my family has got it. And then I take a detailed family history and the penny drops. And then maybe uh, three months later, mum comes along and uh, auntie comes along. And so um, absolutely, you could be the first in your family to be presenting, but, you, but there's likely to be other people in your family who actually got soft signs and symptoms or previously missed diagnoses. Thank you. Dr. Frank Amano, when identifying new types of EDS, what classifies something as an Ehlers-Danlos syndrome specifically rather than another type of connective tissue disorder? Oh, that, that is such an interesting question and it, um, it's a difficult one to answer. I think we kind of think about the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes as a group of hereditary disorders of connective tissue that are primarily characterized by uh, joint hypermobility, generalized joint hypermobility, or in some cases, uh, in, in the vascular type, it's localized uh, hypermobility sometimes, and also involvement of the skin. Those are the first two things. And then there are gonna be, depending on the type, involvement of other organ systems. So I would say in order to classify a newly recognized disorder, it would have to be something that really has a prominent manifestation in the musculoskeletal system with joint hypermobility 
and involvement of the skin to some degree. And then it would be up for discussion about whether those other uh, manifestations in a newly recognized condition are unique enough to create a totally new diagnostic category for them or whether it should go under the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome uh, umbrella. And really, I think that's what our um, scientific symposium uh, in Rome coming up will be doing is looking at newly described um, conditions and saying, do we think it really fits within the umbrella of the Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or does it belong uh, in its own category or with another group of disorders? Thank you, that's really interesting. Um, Dr. Simmons, what, how do you improve proprioception? Oh, I love this question. I love it. So thank you very much to the person who's asked this question. Proprioception is about understanding where your body is in space. And understanding where your body is in space is actually practice. So moving is a very, very important part of developing your proprioceptive ability. So regular movement will enhance that. So any movement, if you're cognitive to it, will enhance it. So message tonight, today, wherever you are in the world, move mindfully, okay? And that will enhance your proprioceptive ability. So however you do that, think about how you move, and that will enhance your proprioception. Thank you. And um, Professor Aziz, um, when diet change and medications don't help rapid gastric emptying and malabsorption absorption is involved, are there other treatment options? Yeah, I'm sure I totally uh, understand the question. I think uh, you know, gastroparesis and malabsorption are slightly different. Uh, they're, they're both different conditions. Uh, you can have one without the other. Um, and you can have both of them uh, together for different reasons. For mal malabsorption, um, we've discussed the treatment for gastroparesis a few times in the question and answer session, but perhaps I should, I can focus on the malabsorption side of things. One has to look at the cause of malabsorption and many different causes of malabsorption. Most well-known cause is celiac disease, for instance, which is a sensitivity gluten. And, uh, and you have a very reliable blood test for that. That will help to screen and you stop eating gluten and your malabsorption will get better. There are other forms of malabsorption. Another common one that I see in patients with EDS is due to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Uh, the bacteria can break down the bile that is secreted uh, by the liver to help digest the fat and therefore there is less bile available and you get fat malabsorption which means that there are lots of vitamins that are fat soluble which are A, D, E and K vitamins that are also um, malabsorbed and you can get deficiency of vitamins and so on and there the treatment is to treat the bacterial overgrowth and the malabsorption um, will go away. Then of course there are specific malabsorptions related to the carbohydrates that we eat. We've got lactose uh, malabsorption and fructose malabsorption and sucrase malabsorption and isomaltase. So there are lots of carbohydrates that because of lack of enzymes that help to absorb these. And one other cause of malabsorption is pancreatic enzyme insufficiency. If the pancreas secretes a lot of digestive enzymes and if these digestive enzymes are not being secreted adequately, that can cause malabsorption. And there is a very straightforward stool test that can help to call fecal elastase which can help you diagnose that. And the treatment for that is to take digestive enzymes with each meal. So one has to look at the different causes of malabsorption to see what it is. Um, severe inflammation, for instance, in a small bowel can cause malabsorption. So they're all different, different causes, multiple causes that need to be looked at um, very, uh, very carefully to try and uh, identify the source. But in most cases, you can find a source for malabsorption. Another one is bile bile acid malabsorption. Some people don't absorb bile 
back into circulation from the lower part of the small intestine, which leads to shortage of bile, and that again causes uh, fat malabsorption. Thank you. And Dr. Hakeem, um, I think this came up on Friday again, but it has come up a few times. Is there any suspicion that um, hypermobile EDS can be a mitochondrial or metabolic disorder? Um, yes, this did come up. I, 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 I think, Claire, you might have answered it, but um, uh, did you answer it, Claire? <laughs> uh, uh, I did not, but I was on the panel that did. Um, would you mind, um, do you remember um, Francisca's response to this? So uh, basically what we said um, on Friday was that because we've had so much difficulty identifying the genetic, uh, underlying genetic contributions to the hypermobile type of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, we kind of have to have a very open mind to all possibilities. And since uh, chronic fatigue and low energy is such a uh, common manifestation, and we know that the mitochondria are powerhouses in our cells and they manufacture the energy, um, the question about mitochondrial dysfunction does come up pretty often. Mm -hmm. So I know one of the things we're doing is making sure when we do the sequencing for the hedge project that the mitochondrial DNA will be included in that. I've had a, 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 just a small handful of patients in, um, in my clinic who uh, I would absolutely think have got um, a, a myopathy of some sort and that uh, the myopathy is the explanation for the majority of their concern when I would otherwise think them to have hypermobile EDS. Um, only one out of uh, those patients has ever come back having had a full workup with a mitochondrial disorder. So my clinical impression amongst people who have the more myopathic type presentation is that actually this is extremely rare. But that's a, that's a, you know, a study of one clinic and, and a personal experience. The, um, the unique thing about mitochondrial inheritance <clears throat> is that we inherit our mitochondria pretty much exclusively from our mother and that the, the mitochondrial DNA goes from the mother to all of the children. Uh, it's not like autosomal dominant where it's 50-50. So um, I have had a couple of families where there've been a large number of children, an affected mom, and like in one case, seven affected children, which on the autosomal dominant hypothesis is extremely unlikely. So we really have a high suspicion for a mitochondrial dysfunction in that family, and uh, that's in the process of being worked up. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you all. So many questions. I think our team today, in fact, over the last few days, we have had in excess of a thousand questions well over between the two platforms. It's really outstanding. And thank you all for answering so many. 